Yeah, so uh, I put together some uh, a talk on our view, what's going on in, in, in the supercomputer, uh, basically the, the industry and, and, and also how Cray is handling some of these and our view about what's coming in the future. So a little bit about Cray, uh, for the ones that don't know, we are still the same Cray, is the, the Cray that was founded by Seymour Cray. Seymour Cray founded Cray, started in 1972, uh, and launched the first Cray in 1976. Uh, and then 1996, it was acquired by SGI, lasted four years and then was acquired by a company called Terra from Seattle. Uh, that was in fact quite a successful merge and that's uh, what formed Cray Inc. and that's what we are today. But still most of, the, I mean, it's the same base. We have people that went in fact through the, all these transitions uh, and people that left, came back and some new, new folks. Uh, today we have about 1,300 uh, employees, uh, well distributed uh, over 20 plus countries. And uh, basically what we do is we build computational tools to help solve uh, grand challenge problems uh, in science and engineering. Uh, and that's in some sense, it's quite uh, exciting to, to work on that because the stuff that we build, we see how it's being used. And, and I mean, we, that, that gives a lot, of, uh, a lot of good things that we, I mean, makes working there quite uh, rewarding. So uh, that's brief sample of customers. We have customers all over the world. Uh, uh, we have, uh, this is in some sense even a somewhat older slide, but uh, we, we have presence in many, many different segments. Uh, Earth science, in fact, being one of the, the, the top ones. Uh, we, I believe we have about 80% of, uh, of the, the segments, including uh, the Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia, in Melbourne, uh, and then other areas, higher education is another area that we have quite a bit of presence. And then a lot of the, the other areas more commercial that we cannot disclose who you, we have as a customer. So, uh, but, the, the, the main topic of the, 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 the presentation here is more looking at how the industry is, uh, what's, what's happening in the industry. And up to uh, five, that was more than five years ago, up to 2005, I would say, things are pretty much, uh, there were not a lot of things happening. It was, you got new processors getting more more speed and that was it. So it was uh, basically single processor, very flat. But then the industry ran into the issues with uh, power and heat and and that's when the, the multi-core era started. So this is kind of a graph after well, 2012 and whatever, but you could see the trends and that still continued, right? So up to 2005, everything was flat, everything was growing. Uh, what happened is basically the, everybody knows Moore's Law and a lot of people associate Moore's Law with the speed of the processors. And, and the reality is it's really associated with the number of transistors as it evolves. And when they hit the, the heat, uh, issues and power, uh, what happened is we moved from just growing the number of processors and, and increasing the speed to growing the number of cores, but uh, 
everything else kind of went flat or decreased. In fact, one thing that we see is frequency is not increasing. Normally, when you have a new processor, what you have is even a slower frequency, but then you have more, uh, more cores. Uh, and that change that was driven by the computer industry uh, influenced a lot on, on application development. So the industry response for that was the, the many multi-core uh, designs and GPU accelerators. Uh, and there is still a lot of stuff going on, right? So what we have seen uh, in these last few years is that the nodes are much more parallel. You have much more processors per node. You have much more threads per processors. Uh, vectorization is, is back and very important now, and the vector lengths are getting longer. Uh, and scale performance is not increasing, as I mentioned, kind of in fact decreasing. And, and like I said, that has a huge influence on how people develop applications. Uh, and what we are seeing is this is not going to change for a while. Right, so uh, the, the HPC systems today and in the near future, and when I say near, I say at least five years, maybe more, uh, what we're seeing is the, we have these, this kind of architecture. We have a massively parallel architecture. Uh, so we have to still deal with message passing. People are looking at alternative options, but because of the, the, the amount of codes out there, message passing is going to stay for quite some time. Uh, however, the nodes are getting white, so multi-threading now is important. We need to, uh, to, to deal with that in several cases, pure MPI, it's not going to do, and vectorization is also important. Vectorization could be only on the CPU, but again, with, with accelerators, some you can think uh, accelerators as basically uh, some way of vectorizing things. And that's, like I said, that's, it's what we have today, in fact, it's what we have in the last few years, and uh, we'll continue with that. And as I said, there is this impacts, a huge impact on how people develop application, right? Because now, uh, and, and in particular, we, we, I mean, we are talking about access scale now. There are a lot of projects already uh, targeting access scale in the near future. And, and there are pre-access scale systems coming. And, and, and at that point, now we're talking really millions of concurrent threads, uh, deal with multiple levels of the memory hierarchy. In fact, we already had systems like KNL that already introduced this kind of stuff. And there might be others coming with the others coming with the same kind of approach. Uh, we need to do, deal with inter-chip parallelism or inter, uh, intra uh, node parallelism uh, with the growth of everything you need to reduce communication, reduce memory access. In fact, flops that used to be quite important in the past are not no longer as important. Uh, really, memory access is is tends to be the major bottleneck these days. You need to target vectorization. So. There is a lot of a lot of things, and, and that's what we say is pretty much another disruptive technology. Uh, the same way that when message passing was introduced to like 20, 30, 25 years ago, uh, we're getting to that same kind of uh, situation, and uh, and and. If we look at uh, software tends to have a lag in terms of adjusting itself. So this is kind of an old uh, set of statistics, but basically was something that was done at NERSC. What they did was they look at all the applications that were launched during a period of time 
in one of their seasons. I said that that was a few years back. And what they were really looking at is from all the applications that are being launched, how many are being launched to use uh, two levels of parameters to use things like OpenMP. So it doesn't mean that the application wasn't ported to OpenMP, but it means that the application was using, uh, was launched to use OpenMP. And what they said, they say is about 80 to 90% of the application was using just one level of parameters. And, and again, like I said, today, people have to look into more than that. Uh, today we have the three levels, like MPI, OpenMP, and accelerators. So uh, that was one of the things showing, yeah, people will have to change. Uh, maybe I pass too many. Uh, no, that's okay. So people will have to, to change the way that they view applications. So let me talk a little about, about a little bit about what Cray is doing with respect to uh, addressing some of these issues, right? So so Cray really focuses a lot on the, the system interconnect. Basically, that's something that we have done many over all these years. I have quite a bit of experience and the other area is in the software, in particular the programming environment, but also kind of the uh, trying to make a streamlined operating system such that you can don't have don't interfere too much with the application. And also packaging our system are very very dense, uh, and we we worry a lot about that. So I'll talk a little bit about the, our current system is the Cray XC uh, supercomputer. Uh, the 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 Axie system is in fact based on on a technology called Dragonfly. Dragonfly, huh? yeah. And uh, and what the, the way that we designed that was uh, basically think about what we call three different ranks. The, the rank one is on the board, basically copper, not copper, basically the, the, the board itself. So pretty, pretty cheap, pretty, pretty fast. Uh, rank two is copper base, so the connections. And rank three is optics. And I'll go into more details about that. But the, the important point here is that by doing uh, these three levels, we were able to deal with price because uh, optics is, is quite expensive, so we are able to, to deal with, with price uh, and cost. So uh, the, the rank one, what we have is the 64, uh, um, 64 nodes that you uh, connect, and they are into the single uh, chassis with uh, 16 compute blades. And one area that, so basically they go here in the back plane, so, uh, and all these, these uh, nodes will, will talk to each other in an all-to-all -all fashion. And, and what happened is, uh, because of the all-to-all, -all, they have a very fast connection. But uh, we also rely on uh, trying to avoid kind of congestion and things like, like that. So, what we we have adaptive routing. So depending on how busy the connections are, they can go in like in two hops, they will go from any place to any other place. Uh, and now we're talking about these 16 uh, uh, nodes all connected. And if you think about building a whole system, uh, you can start with a blade, that's the minimum size that you have, you put this rank one network into a chassis, and then you put uh, two, uh, six of these chassis together, and that consists on the rank two network, which again is an auto all between all these uh, the, the the rank ones. And now uh, you can, if I am assuming like a thirty-two core uh, processor, I can have twenty-four thousand cores in two cabinets, so like I said, very dense, 
and then the drink tree now you can expand to any size and now i'm talking about tens of thousands of of nodes uh, all connected and so the, this is the whole design like i said now we are on xc50 the reason for the number change is, is a different kind of process of technology that we had but the, the the whole design is still still the same uh one uh interesting thing about the dragonfly uh, topology is that uh basically on a very very large system you still can go from any place to another place with no more than five hops uh which make the the system uh very little noise on the system this is a study that was done in Sandia. They got four applications. Uh, each one of the applications were running, uh, sorry, not as uh, a Sandia mini app running at, at CSCS. So they split the, the, they got the four applications and they put all four applications very well uh, placed, uh, so all together. And they kind of split that all the way to a completely random distribution and what you see is that the variation uh, on the performance was very very little which means uh, kind of shows how how efficiency efficiency efficient the dragonfly network is but uh, like I said this is a lot of the the hardware technology this talk is really targeted for application developers and and the question here is okay so how about the software developing environment right so yes a lot of change and like i said there is a huge amount of codes out there so what's what people have to do and one area that uh we view as critical is the the programming environment has to step up to help the application developer. And we see that help coming in three, uh, basically four different ways, right? So one is performance, of course, uh, in particular from Cray, we, we look at uh, uh, supercomputing is, is our, our business. So of course, the best performance is, is always important for us. So we want to help the users to maximize the cycles of the application. But more than that is uh, programmability, which basically help the user to, to, to guess the best of the system without a lot of effort, right? So, so our goal or the goal of the program environment should be to provide the best uh, environment for people to develop, uh, debug, analyze, optimize, tune, uh, applications for productive supercomputing. The other thing is portability. Uh, for, again, for, for a while, there was a very much a domination of x86 in the picture, in particular Intel x86. Uh, now, another thing that we are seeing is uh, other vendors coming to, to in play. Right, so we, we already have ARM-based supercomputers. Cray, in fact, ships one. Uh, we had, Intel itself had different kind of families of, of systems. Intel had uh, the Sterling x86, had the, the Knights, which although it's an x86, you have to program slightly different. Uh, AMD is back into HPC with a very uh, appealing, series called the epic uh and then we have gpus uh with nvidia so a, a, a huge market or a huge uh possibilities of of uh systems and so portability now is really really critical because uh you don't want to program for one particular architecture come two, three years later, the center that you are using is something different. Uh, you don't want to lose your investment. So uh, 
and I'll talk more about that, at Cray we put a lot of effort on that. And of course, scalability. Like I said, we have these wide nodes, we can go to very large systems, and uh, things have to scale. Uh, and part of that loading balance, for example, is critical. Uh, I'm not talking much about tools here, but one example is, there are a lot of tools that you that look at the node performance and try to extract the best out of the nodes. But if your program is not scaling, right, you can even even if you double the performance on the nodes, if you have a scalability problem, that's not going to buy you anything. So scalability today is, is really, really important. So at Cray, we look at that, we look at into providing the best uh, uh, environment for uh, productive supercomputing, as, as I mentioned. All these uh, scalability, performance, portability, programmability are all very important for us. Uh, we, we try to provide the complete, uh, very tightly coupled programming environment to the user, and we put a lot of effort on that. Uh, we focus on two different uh, uh, personas, what we call the build and go, are basically the users that will uh, use third party, uh, uh, mostly community software, uh, but they are not going to develop the software, they just kind of get the software, build it and run. So we have specialized compilers, specialized libraries, to get the best performance out of that. And we also look into what we call the tune and go uh, persona, which are the users that will develop applications, optimize the applications. So again, on that, we put a lot of efforts on uh, performance tools. As I mentioned, we want uh, basically consistency across platforms today at Cray. We ship Intel, x86, AMD x86, ARM, Thunder X2, NVIDIA GPU, so a, a huge variety of options. And we want this, the programming environment with the same look and feel around that. And of course, performance and scalability is very important for us. Uh, we had, uh, one of the interesting things about being at Cray is that uh, we don't have big systems. Uh, we don't have enough money to buy those systems. So we rely on the customer. So at one point we had access to a system at Los Alamos uh, National Lab. Uh, we got access to their full system and we were able to test our MPI running at two million and change ranks. So kind of interesting because if you were talking 20 years ago, just running at the, what I'm calling change today, just running a thousand ranks was a big deal. Now we're running two million ranks. So that's uh, pretty much is, is, is a way of seeing that yes, our tools work, our programming environment work that scale. In fact, the whole software uh, works, the OS, and, and they pretty much uh, can handle those big uh, size of, of process of programs. We also uh, have on the same system, we're able to run uh, tests, our tools, and in fact, we did some work uh, running at 256,000 ranks. And by doing that, we were able to detect bottlenecks on the application, scaling bottlenecks on the application, that after the, the team of uh, application developers addressed the, the bottlenecks that were uh, pointed by the tools, they in fact got the, the whole application running three times faster. But that's also kind of an interesting uh, result, the fact that they bought the machine mostly for that particular application. And after doing the, the, these analysis and fixing the problems, they pretty much got three times the machine because now the application is running three times faster. Uh, so one thing that we, we talk about is with this new era of X scale coming, 
what do you need to support that? And, and basically, we see that we need tools that can provide analysis and automation. And more importantly, we need transitioning tools to assist the user to basically uh, move to these architectures and, and, and basically get load, load balance, get uh, uh, parallelism and other things like that. And uh, so, and, and also you need an environment that allows you to keep adding to it uh, a step of a time. So, uh, one of the things that we, we talk about is if you look into uh, hybrid codes, right? So I, I mentioned about uh, one of the, the needs is to, for people to parallelize applications. And uh, that's not that trivial. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But the reason is, based on what I said, now we have wide nodes, we have more vectorization coming, we have GPUs, so you really need to look into parallelizing applications. And, and here's an example with a real application called VH1, uh, or VHome. And uh, if you look at a standard loop on that, that application, you say, oh, that shouldn't be complicated to parallelize. However, if I look in depth, I say, oh, it has a functional call. So if I just parallelize this thing, uh, I may have dependence because of that, that function call. If I look at the function call, then I see that that particular function calls several other functions. So now you may in fact have a very deep call chain and understanding the scoping of the very, uh, variables after they go through these, uh, all these function calls can be, in fact, it's really difficult to do and uh, by hand, right, and, and very error prone. So in order to help with that, uh, or basically one thing I'm looking at is, can I use a tool that will help me? And, and we, in fact, identify like four different steps that you can, uh, that you have to go through. So first you have to identify which loops to, to accelerate. You could just try to parallelize everything, but sometimes you have loops that will uh, degrade performance if you parallelize. Uh, then uh, for the ones that you identify, you need to do a uh, scoping analysis, you add OpenMP, and uh, and then you look at other things. You look at performance information, you look at vectorization and other things. And if you are using GPUs, uh, by adding OpenMP, then you can go and, and, and basically add directives to, to run on GPUs. So we created a tool at Cray called Reveal. Uh, this tool basically helps you to do that. Uh, so the first step is, the tool works together with the compiler, works together with uh, the, the performance tools, and uh, basically combining static analysis from the compiler, runtime analysis from the performance tools, it identifies which ones are the loops that are important for the user to look into parallelizing. Uh, it gives information, compiler information, like what's happening with the loops, if you don't know what those letters mean, there is kind of a, a, a way of understanding that. And then, like I said, the step number two is you have to select a few loops to go and parallelize or, and do the scoping. So uh, the tool allows you to do the scoping analysis. It will return you information. Uh, if it returns like green information, everything is fine. But it will also tell you things that are unresolved, things that, for example, oh, I cannot parallelize a particular variable because I have a, a reduction, or uh, there are several other things that can inhibit parallelization. So what will happen is instead of not parallelizing, the tool will tell you, okay, uh, if you tell me if 
for these set of variables, what what uh, need to be done? Uh, then we can maybe uh, parallelize the loop. And uh, after that, uh, you can just generate OpenMP directives. Uh, there are, in fact, two things that the tool can do. It's, if, if everything is fine, the tool will generate the correct uh, OpenMP directive. And I don't think I have here, but if there are things that I don't know, then the tool will, will generate an not complete OpenMP direct, there will, there will be things that we'll mark and say, you have to figure out the scope of that. But the big deal here is instead of having to scope thousands of variables, you, you will have to scope on a few of the variables uh, to, to use. The one thing that's interesting, we're talking to customers about this tool and saying, oh, we can tell you what are the, the uh, how to generate OpenMP and things like that. And they said, oh, if you can look at that, can you validate the OpenMP that I already have? Uh, so we added that as a, as a part of the tool. So the tool reads an OpenMP, does the whole scoping, and is able to tell the user, oh, by the way, you have the incorrect scoping for a particular variable. In this case, for example, this, this was scoped as shared, it should be private, and things like that. And then the last step is, okay, we need to do performance analysis. Uh, we, uh, one thing that we add the tool, in fact, is you can navigate through your source code based on compiler methods. So, for example, in this case, I'm saying, let's show me all the loops where the compiler was not able to vectorize. Uh, and then two will, will highlight that, and you can go there and look at message saying it was not vectorized because of a particular reason. Uh, if you don't understand the message, then we have an option with a much better description of uh, the issues, and you can basically change your code based on these to help uh, the compiler to parallelize. So that's a tool that's uh, very unique in the industry uh, called Reveal. Uh, we use that tool a lot to not only to parallelize, like I said, to understand uh, what the compiler did with regards to vectorization. We use this tool also for memory analysis. I don't have slides here about that, but there, there is a functionality for that. And we use this tool to generate code for, for GPUs. So the other thing that's uh, important uh, is it's kind of interesting because, we, again, if you're talking uh, years ago, debugging was considered to be a, a solved problem, right? So yeah, there's not a lot of stuff to do. With these large scales, uh, debugging is uh, back to be a pretty good research problem, right? Uh, so at Cray, we rely on the traditional debuggers, like Total View and DDT, just uh, for the standard control-centric debugging. But we, we basically look a lot into tools for uh, scalability and portability. And so some, those are some of the tools that we, we have. Uh, one is a tool that we call STAT, Stack Trace Analysis Tool. The general idea, and, and all these tools are based on a technology that comes from the University of Wisconsin in, in, in the US called MRNet. And MRNet is a technology that allow you to build uh, scalable tools. So the first one is STAT. And the, the general idea here is you have an application that may be hanging, you want to see what's going on, you want to see the backtrace of that application, but uh, turns out that you're running that thing at scale, so how do you do that? What stack will do is we we'll generate what we call a merged backtrace that looks something like this. Uh, and with these numbers basically tells you Okay, these, uh, for example, I'm running 10,800 
ranks, then it's telling me 10,798 are in this branch of the tree, and those are the ranks that are there. I have one here and one here and things like that. So it easily you can identify where things are and identify problems that may be causing the application to hang or to, to, to be too slow. So like I said, this, we, uh, in collaboration with Livermore, we, they developed the tool, we ported the tool to Cray, and we shipped them all our systems. Another one that we build is this abnormal termination processing. And the idea here is you have uh, an application that's running at scale in production and the application crashes. So again, the problem is, okay, you don't even have the bug symbols. You may not have the bug symbols on the application. How do you figure out that, what's going on? And uh, one way of looking into that is uh, we create this abnormal termination processing, which is called ATP, that's just running the background, kind of sleeping. If the application crashes, it comes into action and will generate a stack-like backed, uh, backtrace like this, merged backtrace, so they can user access that. Uh, if the tool is set up, I mean, if the application is set up to, to, to generate core files or the system is set up to generate core files, one of the things is which core file do you want? Do you want one core file? Do you want all the core files? They are not going to be very helpful. So what ADP will do is will generate one core file for each one of the leaves of the application. So you can at least have a much reduced set of core files. Uh, it can, in fact, even hold the application while it's crashing, so you can go there and attach a live debug, uh, live debugger into that, so you can debug the application while it's crashing. So that's ADP. The other one uh, is what we call uh, the comparative debugger, and that's uh, from a collaboration with Dave, uh, Many, many years ago, in fact, that's, uh, we, they've had a, a, a tool called the Relative Debugger. And so my contribution to the project was to change the name to Comparative Debugger because my relatives don't need debugging. So, uh, so that's my... Huh? <laughs> that's not clear, exactly. They may need. So uh, the idea of the comparative debugger is you have one application that's working. We do, you do a lot of changes on the application and the change can be, and there are several different things that you can think. You can just uh, change the algorithm or you can change the programming model. Let's say added OpenMP, added GPUs, or even you can change for some reason for one language to a different language, or uh, compiler levels optimization, any kind of change, and now your application is not, not, no longer working. So as long as you have points in the code that you say, at this point, my variable should be all the same, uh, then instead of putting breaks, so we create a, a graphical user interface for that, and the idea is you run the two applications together, Instead of putting breakpoints, you put comparison points, basically it's a comparative debugger, and the, the two will run the two together. Uh, underneath it uses a manet for scalability. So in fact, we run, uh, we, we had a supercomputer paper in 2015 where we showed these two working on uh, Titan, which is a huge GPU system. Uh, we run at 5,000 GPUs. Uh, and got uh, all valid and good results. So, and then as you, as you run, uh, you got these comparison points and the tool will show you areas, uh, basically the live variables that are not uh, matching. And from there you can basically identify uh, what the problems are. And, uh, and of course the tool has a lot of, uh, Additional details like 
tolerance controls and ways of doing array subsets and things like that. Uh, but it's a very, again, it's a very unique tool in the industry. Like I said, we, we have been, we worked on that uh, for quite some time. Uh, Cray, uh, not Cray, uh, Dave had the tool. We, on our first collaboration, what we did, we, we made the tool scalable by adding MRNet and by running at a large scale. And then we continue that by expanding the tool to support uh, GPUs. Uh, and today we ship the tool part of the, the, the Cray programming environment. So it was a very successful result out of those uh, of that collaboration. So I talked a, quite a bit about uh, accelerators. Let's uh, see how, I mean, that's another area that today it's, it's here for sure. Uh, if we're talking a few years ago, people were still debating. Uh, there were alternative processors like, K, like the, the, the many, many cores processors. Today, uh, every major system or in the next few years, I think if you look at the top 500, haven't looked uh, closely, but certainly the top five, uh, I think they are all uh, GPUs. Certainly the top three, I know that they are all GPUs. And there are new uh, GPU systems coming. Uh, at Cray, we just had a contract with NERS that's, that's already announced that we'll have a GPU system over there. And they have been a traditional CPU only site. So GPUs is, is pretty much part of the, the, the view today, right? So our uh, approach to GPU computing or to accelerated computing is uh, people can program at the lower level like CUDA. The problem with CUDA is that uh, it's not really portable, even between different, uh, different GPUs within NVIDIA. And we had examples of that. Just they changed the family and the CUDA performance wasn't, wasn't I had issues. Uh, and it's very hard to program. So in order to program, kind of address the whole community, uh, our vision is that we need uh, a high level way of programming. And the way that we look at that is basically programming with Fortran C and C++ with directives and having a whole programming environment around to support. So at Cray, what we do is we, we support basically higher level programming with uh, OpenMP target directives, the directives to access the GPU. Uh, if you have CUDA codes, you can in fact mix these CUDA codes with uh, directives. Uh, we have, I talked about CCDD, uh, we also support debuggers for like DDT and Total View. Uh, I talked about Reveal, which uh, we build in fact to help doing the porting, and we talked about uh, scientific library support, and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so the, the issue about directives is that, yeah, you can lose a little bit of performance, but the, the gain that you have in productivity and portability pretty much compensate that. And our target is, if we have the same uh, algorithm, we shouldn't be worse than 80% of, of what you, you can get with CUDA, for example. And one example that we had is, we had in one of way, way back, we mentioned about blue orders, for the blue orders acceptance, we had to, to prove that. And, and what we had was we had a code, we had to, show a code that was uh, written in CUDA, an optimized code, and it's always debatable. But since another requirement was for that code to reach a certain level of performance, 
So we took that code as, yeah, it's really optimized, and it was. So when we were building Blue Waters, we had two different, uh, as the time was, was getting to Blue Waters, we started to a platform called Fermi, uh, just as a test base, and then we went to Kepler. And so when we first run with Fermi's, we saw that the, the performance difference between our directed base and, and uh, CUDA was only 3% off. We said, oh, great, we're done. But we put everything aside. Uh, when we had to run the acceptance for Blue Waters, we just got the, the two codes, the CUDA code and the, the directives code, recompile everything, run on Kepler, and now the difference was 12% better for the directives over CUDA, which was kind of a surprise. So how come uh, you are getting better? And the, re the, re the realization was between these two Fermi and Kepler, there were changes in the memory subsystem, which the compiler adjusted for that, but the CUDA code wasn't adjusted for that. So not only the portability, but then even performance, uh, has an effect there. Uh, one thing that we did with our performance tools was uh, basically when we look at our performance tools, we look at the whole application. So we look at uh, the, the, the processor, the nodes, the communication, I.O. If we have GPUs, we look at the GPUs. So we have this, what I call this holistic approach for performance analysis, uh, which is quite important, in particular, if you're dealing with GPUs, because with GPUs, you have some additional things, in particular, the memory utilization and data movement. So our tools really focus on that, and also focus on giving you a view uh, on you have like here's the CPU, here's the GPU, how the CPU and the GPU are working together. And then the last thing to talk about is our uh, what we did with well, our scientific libraries. So with scientific libraries, I think there are quite a bit of scientific libraries for GPUs. Uh, there is Magma that's quite quite famous, and there is all the CUDA uh, libraries. The problem is all of them require the user to uh, basically change the source code. So what we did was we built a library that you can use that library without changing the source code. The library has in fact multiple interface, but the basic interface what will happen is, let's say you call a matrix multiplication, what the library will do is, First thing is to check where is the data. The data is already on the GPU. It will just compute on the GPU when you are done. If the data is in the CPU, then the library will check, do I have enough computation to do that's worth moving the data to the GPU? So if not, just compute on the CPU when you are done. If you have, then move the data to, uh, to the GPU, but then you the library will compute like a hybrid version. So it doesn't move everything, it moves most of the data, leaves some on the, the CPU and use both the CPU and the, the GPU. So here's an example just by doing that. If I were doing only on the GPU, I would be running at about uh, 3.5 gigaflops, but because I moved, I do this hybrid CPU, GPU, I'm running over four gigaflops. So I, I, I got uh, 10, 20% uh, performance better there by using both. So this is the summary for the GPU part. Uh, we pretty much support a complete programming environment that was all uh, target for uh, heterogeneous computing um, at a higher level. And uh, the conclusion for the talk, 
uh, strength scaling computing systems will be more parallel but will require a lot of uh, some effort from the users to port and to use them efficiently so at Cray, we put a lot of effort in the programming environment to help users to use them. But uh, application developers will still have to deal with quite a bit of uh, details because of this change in the paradigm of uh, programming. So, thank you.